So you're here for the, sec the security talk? Not? Hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, bad security configuration. Um, we all know it happens. Okay. It's, I mean, we talk about default configuration, misunderstanding, all of that. It, bad security configuration is always there. So today we're going to have a look at security in the context or underneath PCI. So the first thing is, what is PCI? PCI is the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council, and PCI DSS is the data security standard set by PCI. It's a set of standards for systems that process credit card payments. The first version was released in December 2004, and the most recent version was uh, from May last year. It, it's basically 12 requirements that are logically grouped into six objectives. That's what it looks like. We're not going to worry about the detail on that. But instead, we're going to look at the simplified version. So the first, the first objective is firewalls. Then there's users and access, encryption, updates, application design, auditing, and documentation. So who here handles credit card information? I don't mean passing it off to a gateway if you directly handle credit card information. Does anybody here do that? You do? Oh, okay, you do. You're a bank. Okay, so if you do, you go read up in PCI. I mean, there's just no way there. I mean, it's the sort of thing that if you so much as handle credit card information, you have to comply with everything in PCI. And it's... A, it's a case where no company or situation is exempt. You can't ever say, oh, I'm a small company, therefore I don't know. It's a blanket thing. So PCI compliance is binary. You either are or you are not compliant. The problem is much of the standard is open to interpretation. So one person will say, but it's compliant, and an auditor will come along and say, it's not compliant, and you have to sort of figure that bit out. But the important thing about this is being compliant with PCI does not mean you are unhackable. So even if you don't handle credit card information and you make yourself PCI compliant, it doesn't mean that you can sit back and ignore security. You are still always hackable. All right, so if you don't handle credit card information, which is all but like three people in the room. So PCI isn't only about handling credit card information you can still apply the standards that are specified within PCI. It's just, you're just not bound to actually comply with them. You're not required to comply with them and be audited to show that. But you can still use it as a standard and try and, you, um, and do as much as you can with it. So irrespective of whether you handle credit card information or not, this talk is for you. Do not wait until after a breach happens to deal with security. Do everything you can to secure your system now. All right. The important thing is this is not a talk about PCI. It's a talk about securing Postgres and your data using objectives within the PCI framework. Okay, so to have, the first thing we'll have a look at is the default users and configuration. Don't ever use the root user. Use sudo so there's an audit trail. Log in as, a, as yourself, every person has their own user. Log in and use sudo to run what you need to. There are certain situations where you have to be root to do stuff instead of sudoing all the time. Then sudo minus i still has a order trail to say this user became root at this time. So always use something like sudo. Then for the Postgres side, never use the Postgres database user or the OS user. Ignore that it even exists. Always set a password on those users so they cannot be used. Uh, one nice idea is for something like the root user, have a two parts to your password, so a prefix and a suffix. And you, the, the suffix stays, this, or the prefix can stay the same across your service, the suffix changes, then let's say one of your sysadmins leaves, all you have to do is change the prefix. So you don't have to now go and change 20 service passwords. Or if you really want tight security, then one person knows the prefix, another person knows the suffix. So you need two people to provide the password to log in as root. So those are just ideas for being extremely secure on root. But as a baseline, always set a password on there so people can't just log in or become root without actually having a very good reason for it. Always change default passwords. It sounds obvious. 
And every time I, I sort of bring this up, somebody's like, oh no, but be, it's, it should be a given. And then you can still find um, devices on your network that have default passwords. So I mean, we're not only talking necessarily about specific users on a server, but any device you have with a default password you should consider changing. And then I've mentioned the dual custody. And so instead of having, instead of using the root of Postgres users, every user has their password. And if you've got a lot of users, using something like LDAP makes it a lot simpler to, to manage users across multiple servers. And if a specific user needs super admin or super user rights, then go into the database and say, grant super user to that person. That person shouldn't say, oh, I need to create a table, I must now be Postgres. That person can actually create a table if they're just a super user. So avoid using the default um, root and Postgres users. Give the respective people the necessary privileges they need, because it becomes easy to grant and revoke those privileges per person, as opposed to wondering, who has access to Postgres user. The next thing is don't ever use the config straight out of the box. Obviously, if you're testing something and you're just experimenting or trialing something, that's fine. But as soon as you start doing more development on, on something, stop using the default configuration. I've, I've had the uh, a silly thing where I was just working with a Raspberry Pi connected to my internal LAN. I thought, okay, let me get it working for 3G, plug it into 3G, and an hour later, the machine was sitting there in a reboot loop. Somebody had just sniffed, found that it tried to, tried to log in as Raspberry Pi over the 3G network, did it, rootkitted the machine. Because what's the, what can the Pi user do on, on Raspberry? Pseudo. So of course you can do anything. So it's, it's something so silly like that, like just rootkitting a Raspberry Pi, but always change your, out of the, your, your default configuration. Never just use something and assume, especially not for a production system. So something like that is bad. Running sudo minus i, and you just become root. Or saying psql and a database, and getting straight in. That's a lot better, where you actually get prompted for a password to do it. From a firewall perspective, dedicated firewalls are always a good idea. Um, so that it means that your application and database servers are not necessarily exposed directly on the public network. Specify your most restrictive rules you can. If it doesn't need to have outside access, it doesn't need to be visible from the outside, don't let it be visible. Don't give it access from the outside. Don't allow direct SSH access from outside. Okay? Not even on another port. I know there are some people in this room that love to expose SSH. I'm not looking at you directly. On other ports. Um, I wasn't looking at I was looking, Actually, I should have been looking at you. All right, because people sniff. They don't just sniff on port 22. They will, they will port sniff all the ports and see what protocols there. And they go, oh, here's SSH. Let me attack it there. Sure, it's less likely, but it still happens. Uh, we run our SFTP server on port 2022 because it clashes with 22, and we still get attacks on 2022. Even though it's a different port number, people still actually they find it, and they still run SFTP attacks against it. Rather use a VPN. Uh, let me go back there. So uh, alternative to a VPN is a bounce box where you log into that one server and it can have restrictive rules or um, what's that? What's it called again? Um, I'll get its name later. Um, or you, oh, the name's dropped for me. Um, you, can monitor the, you can monitor the logs and pick up those things and automatically add a rule to IP tables. I'll get its name later if I remember. Failed to ban, there we go. So that, that monitors, it can monitor any amount of logs and automatically add an IP tables rule to block any, um, any attempts against, the, against SSH. That's one option, to log into that and then from there elsewhere, or just have a VPN. It's so much simpler. If you're running a, any level of decent firewall, um, even Microtix, the cheap entry 300 Rand Microtix can do VPNs. You VPN into it, and you can access your network behind it. Okay, but of course, we all know that proper firewalls are expensive. And if you're hosting in the cloud, a dedicated firewall is not feasible because you don't have a physical machine and a physical network to necessarily protect. But there are some cloud providers that op offer a cloud um, appliance that acts as a firewall behind a private network. Not all, but some do. So in addition to dedicated firewalls, IP tables, which is your software firewall, if you don't know. Um, some distributions 
sort of, uh, sort of hard IP tables with a simpler version in the front, but it's still IP tables in the back end. I would say always configure your IP tables. Even if you are behind a dedicated firewall, still configure it. It's another line of defense for it. If somebody breaches in, manages to get past your firewall on one server, IP tables helps block anything else that happens. The default in IP tables is just to accept everything. So that's the sort of policy you get. It's IP tables is running, but everything is just accepted by default. In other words, lock it down. Block access to port 5432, your Postgres port, unless it's coming from servers that need to connect. Allow your management ports, obviously, if you need to get in your SSH, but again, only from IPs or VPN connections. So if you know where, the IPs, know where you're coming from, that's fine. Or if you have a VPN connection, allow those. Don't just say, accept port 22. Say, accept port 22 on the source address. If you have people that work from, or have dynamic IP, so using 3G or sitting at home or on the move, again, simple, just use a VPN. The world shouldn't see anything in your infrastructure, okay? And the world should not have to know that your database even exists. From their perspective, all they should see is your application or your API. They should not even know what the IP address of your database server is in reality. Okay, so now we've looked at dedicated firewalls, and we've looked at IP tables as a software firewall. Do you know that Postgres has a built-in sort of firewall? Who does not know that? Okay. Have you heard of the PGA, PGHBA file at least? Okay. <laughs> so the PGHBA file is essentially like a, like a miniature software firewall built within Postgres. So with, with a dedicated firewall with IP tables, you can say this IP range and this port and things like that. You can do a little bit more complicated work with, with marking of packets and that, but in the simplistic uh, form, source IP, destination IP, and ports, you can do that in IP tables and dedicated firewalls. Whereas with PGHBA, you can do it down to a database and user level, so it's just adding another level to it. And it's the one thing that stumps most people when moving from MySQL to Postgres. Because MySQL, you have the, the, a user with this password from this IP, Whereas with Postgres follows a more POSIX type approach with one user and then the access they have. And that, that's the sort of thing that, that gets most MySQL people and then they sort of ignore the PGHBA and just allow everything because that makes it work. Um, but that's, again, it's not necessarily the right way. Uh, I've said that. So it acts as a miniature firewall within your database. But the default only allows local host. Okay, and it doesn't require a password. So you end up with something like this, where you have, um, you could say, it's, it's a local, any database, all users, and then the ident says as long as it's the same user. So Postgres can log in as Postgres, um, Joe can log into database Joe, and that's fine. As long as it's within the same user, it's fine. And obviously, this, the local is when you connect something like with, with just PSQL or you use a socket connection, whereas the host ones are if you do a TCP connection either on IPv4 address or your IPv6 address. But that's the default configuration. Okay? And most people just go and they change and they just add an IP range and they don't necessarily change the method. So don't ever use the trust, peer, or ardent methods. Okay? Never use the password method either. It sounds counterintuitive. I'm telling you to always use passwords, but it's not the right one. That's a clear text password. Rather use the scram MD5 LDAP or radius options. MD5 is, instead of password, you should use MD5. And the new one as from Postgres 11 is scram. And scram in a simplistic way says the client goes, I know the password, and asks the server, do you know the password? The server says, I know the password, do you? And then they sort of say, okay, yes, we do. Without the password ever traveling across the network, Scram is able to verify that both parties know the password. Okay, so with MD5, it still sends something across that can be intercepted, whereas with Scram, the password's never actually transferred across. And there are ways to convert from MD5 to Scram. And you don't ever need to allow connections to template one or Postgres databases. Okay, template one's only needed when you create a new database, but you can also utilize any other database to seed your database from. And the Postgres database, 
He should ever, never, ever need to connect to it. Again, like we said with IP table dedicated firewalls, be specific about the IPs and ranges you allow, even with hosts on your local network, because you don't just want to implicitly trust your whole network, because one Windows um, Exchange server can get compromised and people then gain access from there. So always just be specific about the hosts that actually need, data, need access. And again, be specific about the users that, that you allow and to which databases. Don't just give blanket access and say, allow from any user to any databases. You can use groups. If you put a plus in front of the username, you're basically saying this group can access this database. And that's another nice way to, a, a employee leaves, you remove them from the group, and that user is now lo no longer able to, to actually access the data. Whereas if you just say anyone, you suddenly don't know. Or if you're using a shared user, you don't know who actually has access. If you're running a hosting um, environment where you've got virtual hosts or clients that have their own database, if the OS name and the database name are the same, you can say same, bless you, you can say same user, and that will restrict it to that specific client that can connect. On a Postgres config side, only listen on your specific IPs. Um, by default, it will listen on localhost, and a lot of people just go say, listen, star. Um, but if you're listing on multiple IPs, that can again open up in a way you might not expect. There's a nice extension called auth delay. If you put it in and, the, and somebody logs in, they're not going to notice a half second authorization delay if something goes wrong. But if somebody's trying to brute force a login against your database, this slows them down considerably. So you basically just in your config, you say uh, shared preload libraries equals auth delay, and then auth de delay dot milliseconds is 500. And that gives you, you can configure that to any amount you want. It just, it just slows down a failed auth attempt so that you cannot just hit the database with uh, lots of uh, login attempts. To enable scram authentication, password encryption equals scram SHA-256. All right, next thing we'll have a look at is TLS within Postgres. The simple question is, why would you not want it enabled? So always have it enabled, even for local connections on your database. That specific point is if you're running on a cloud hosting infrastructure, because other people have, can have means to sometimes sniff the traffic. Rather, don't trust that your, that your network is secure unless you physically wired it up yourself and nobody else knows or has access to it. But if you don't have implicit trust of your network, just enable TLS for everything. The overhead, once you connect it, is minimal these days. If you've, who hasn't used Let's Encrypt for certificates? Okay. So since, since Let's Encrypt's been around, getting certificates is now just super trivial. And I, I, have, I don't think I've actually renewed a certificate in about three years now. It just happens in the background. I don't ever care about it. You can also use self-signed certificates if you are not able to use the Let's Encrypt option. It does work. Um, yeah. So the other thing with TLS is always try and restrict it to your, your best cipher that you can offer. Almost every single modern system will happily accept the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman um, with AES GC. That's all you need. It's such a simple configuration. If you do have a slightly older system, you can enable the AES CBC, otherwise drop it. It's got vulnerabilities in it. So if you're running Postgres less than 12, which 99% of you probably would be, because it's so new, we did not have control over the TLS version that was used. Um, it basically said, allow any TLS version one and higher. So luckily it did not have SSL 2 or 3 enabled, but you couldn't disable TLS 1 or 1.1. So TLS 1 is now 20 years old, I think, 21 years old. It came out in the late 90s. That's how old it is. And we still think, oh, TLS is fine. It's actually really old in comparison. And that's why no almost nothing ever needs it these days. If you have Postgres 12 or higher, then the SSL min protocol version and SSL max protocol version can be set in order to limit it. So I would suggest setting the min protocol version to TLS 1.2. Or if you know that you can support 1.3, you can use that. So 
the PCR standard dropped support for TLS version 1, and they're busy talking about dropping support for 1.1, because anything that supports 1.1 is almost guaranteed to support 1.2. So if we're talking about certificates. If you um, issue a new certificate, you obviously have to pick up the new certificate. Postgres less than 10, you have to unfortunately restart. But with Postgres 10 and higher, it's just a reload to pick up the new certificate. The key must disallow access to, the, to world and group. In other words, you want chmod 600 on your key, or the file can be owned by root, root with Postgres group read access, in which case you'd have chmod 640. If you don't have that, Postgres will issue an error on startup and say that the permissions are wrong. These are the permissions you do need for it. If your key has a passphrase, then the server will prompt for that, that pass phrase on start and not, will not start until it's been entered. Um, you can either use the SSL passphrase command and just echo it in, but then just know that your passphrase is now in a readable config file, so it kind of mitigates that. Um, the alternative is to, with the SSL passphrase command, to use systemd to prompt for that. But again, it's an attended startup. So when Postgres starts up, somebody has to actually type the password in. So that was TLS within your database, but what about TLS in your application? It doesn't help if your data is secure if your, if your application is transmitting in clear text. So why not enable it? So I don't just mean for web applications, I mean for APIs as well. Again, Let's Encrypt makes this easy. We don't have any reason to not have SSL anymore, TLS certificates. If you have really old clients that don't support Let's Encrypt, it's like $9 for a certificate from somebody else, and it's probably just gonna get cheaper while they try and compete in the market. Then to enforce it, you say in your pghba.conf, you change it from host to host SSL, and that then requires that the client connects with SSL. On your client side, you can also stipulate and say SSL mode is require, because by default it's prefer, so if there's a SSL certificate available, the client will use it, but if you want to force it to use it, you change it to require. You can also sp uh, stipulate verify your certificate authority or verify full for better assurance to make sure you're connecting to the expected server, and otherwise it just bypasses those checks. So the, generals, the general TLS settings irrespective, turn prefer ciphers on. Your ciphers, if you're running something like OpenSSL 1.1 or higher, you can use the ChaCha 20 cipher. Otherwise, your elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman with AES-GCM uh, or your ephemeral uh, Diffie-Hellman with the same one. And if you need older cipher support, then you can add those variants. And just the important one, the last one, always have exclamation DSS just to, to explicitly disable the DSS variant of the ciphers. They're not secure. So the Postgres TLS settings would look something like that. So SSL on, your, your cipher set to the, the elliptic curve and the ephemeral ones. Prefer server ciphers on. So what that one does, let me just explain it. When the client and the server want to talk TLS, they basically say, well, this is what I can do. The server says, well, this is what I will accept. And if that, server, that setting is off, then the client will choose. And you have no guarantee what security level. Some, some browsers don't even put their most, secure, um, their most secure protocol first. So on a web application, you might, might support a few ciphers, and your client ends up connecting on an old AES CVC cipher, even though both client and service support a very, very um, or a much stronger cipher. So always turn that on, because then you're in control of the, the order of ciphers that can be used. Then you have your SSL certificate file, your key, and then a link to your CA bundle. And that path will differ based on distributions. It's just an idea. It changes name. Sometimes it's CA certificates. Sometimes it's CA bundle. Just look for the, the applicable file on your distro. For Apache and Nginx, those are, the, those are the settings. So it's the same sort of thing, just with different names. With Apache, one thing that's nice is you can say, all protocols and explicitly disable, because then when, if you, let's say you're, you had TLS 1.2 available, and you update your system, now you have 1.3, it will automatically add support for it. 
With, in, with Nginx, it's unfortunately not like that, so you've got to explicitly add it, but yeah, you can define it then in pretty much the same way. All right, so the other thing to have a look at is data encryption. In other words, whole disk encryption. This is useful if you have a risk of your hard drives being stolen. So if somebody can walk into your data center or into your server room or wherever, walk in and physically take out a hard drive. It's not impossible. People have no, been known to actually do that, to try and gain access to data. If you're worried about that, or you, or you have sensitive enough information, such as medical or financial information, whole disk encryption is, is sort of the thing you need to be looking at to make sure that your data is that much more secure. All right. The downside is you need to physically enter a key on startup. In other words, as the server starts up, somebody needs to be there at the keyboard to type in a passphrase in order to allow the server to continue booting. Uh, there was one other point on that. The, 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 okay, so the important thing to also remember with, with full whole disk encryption is once the server is running, the data is decrypted. So if somebody gains shell access to your server, even though you might have disk encryption, the data is still visible to anyone that's accessing your data after the fact. If, so for that, what we can rather have a look at is per column encryption, in other words, encrypting only the sensitive columns in your database. PG Crypto lets you do this as part of a query. So when you insert the data, you can have PG Crypto encrypt the data before inserting into the column and have it decrypt the data on reading out. But think carefully before using PG Crypto, because your unencrypted data and importantly your key can inadvertently appear in log files. So if you've got log min, sta uh, log min statement duration enabled, you say anything longer than 100 milliseconds must be logged, and that insert or select takes too long, that gets logged. And it's not just the unencrypted data, your key is there. So somebody manages to gain access to your database, looks through your logs, finds a call to PG Crypto, finds your key, and now they can access anything in your, in your column. So if you do use PG Crypto, check your configuration in terms of logging. and Make sure that you aren't accidentally going to log your, your key and your unencrypted data. The other option is to look at managing your encryption from within your application, because that way you're not accidentally going to log it out. Who dumps data and ships it off? Somewhere, as in it doesn't matter if it's in the same. Okay, do you encrypt your data before you ship it off? You do, you don't? Okay, so consider encrypting your data before shipping it off. So if you dump your database, you ship it off, encrypt it, and send it off. Or as part of your dump, pipe it into OpenSSL, have it encrypt as part of the process, and then you have an encrypted dump file. Secure your off-site server the same way you would your production server. Don't think that it's another server, you don't have to worry about it. It should be equally secure as your production server, because anything that gets compromised there will compromise your production server. Next thing, who dumps data and loads it into a dev or test system? Okay. Is your dev and test system equally as secure as your production system? Okay, so in other words, somebody just has to compromise your dev or test system and they gain access to production data. So there are options. Um, I think Cybertech actually deals with some of this. They do data masking and obfuscation. So go, maybe go chat to Hans about it if you do that. So you dump your data. You obfuscate it and then load in the obfuscated data into dev and test system. So if somebody compromises that, or the other thing is you, you give a database dump to a developer to test on their laptop, you're not giving them production data. If their lap, laptop gets stolen, it's obfuscated data. All right, so if we have a look at just simple data access, not every data developer needs access to the database. Some do in order to, to manage data or to handle queries or uh, handling bug reports but not every database, uh, every developer needs access to the database. And if they do, not every developer needs access to the whole database. You know, it's maybe, maybe, maybe I should change the word to developer, I should say user. Um, so not every user needs access to the whole database. Okay, and not every developer needs access to the server. Some do need to log in, in like into, the, into a shell, not all of them do. If you're using a CI environment or another build process, 
they don't need to log in except for deb uh, debugging purposes or bug, bug reports. So you can use database level grants. So you say grant a set of permissions on database to a group. You can use schema level grants where you say grant permissions on a schema to a group. Or table level grants. Again, you see the pattern. Grant permissions on a table to a group. You can also do column level grants. Who knew you could do column level grants? Okay, so there you say on the table, you, like nobody accesses it, or say your application server accesses it. But your developers or, a, or another set of users needs access to a specific set of columns. On those columns, you say grant permissions on the, the list of columns or on the column to a, on, a, on a table to a group. So you can stipulate it down to that level. There's also row level policies. Um, Benny actually did a good talk about that last year, was it? Yeah. Um, so you can, you can do row level policies. They do have a slight performance impact, but you can, on a per, le a per row basis, as you select the database, data out of the database, on each row, a policy is run to see, are you even able to access this row? So you can get very, very, very granular control over access to your data. You can also block updates to columns that shouldn't be updated. So you can say, you can, you can select, you can insert into this, so this, um, this user, this group, this application user, whichever, can select an insert, but this column is the only one that's allowed to do an update. So if you know your data goes in, and an, a specific, like let's say a timestamp field of when something's processed, if that timestamp is only ever on insert, why would you allow it to be updated? Because that affects data integrity. So you can, you can prevent update on, that, on the table and just say update a status column, and then you can't update and fudge data. A monitoring user, so if you have a monitoring system monitoring your database, the monitoring user should not be able to do anything else other than monitor the specific things it needs to see. So it has no reason to have a grant all to a monitoring user. It should be a grant select on specific things. Um, some monitoring systems check your sequences, so you say just uh, grant select on the sequence, nothing more. Never ever use the public permission. Never say grant all to public. Who does that? Now that I've just said you must, and now you're going to put their hands up. Um, never ever use the public because it just means anyone can do it. So revoke from public and grant to specific groups or users. Again, I've said this many times, be as restrictive as possible. Protecting from malware, this is another one of the PCI requirements. It's less of a challenge. I'm not saying it's not a challenge, but it's less of a challenge on Linux, less of an issue. Um, but only ever install software from reputable repos. Don't just say, oh, I'm looking for this package. Oh, here's some guy in some unknown corner of the world. I'll use his repo and trust it. You can't trust it. Always look for a reputable place to install software from. And don't forget about other servers in your network. Your database server and your application server aren't the other ones. There are other servers that may be managed by other teams, and you need to make sure that they are also up to date, they are also secure. And the other thing, what about your laptops and desktops? Are they up to date? Are they protected from malware? Anyone that compromises your laptop, you type in a password to log in, and you might be exposing that. So PCI extends even to that level. We're making sure that the user's laptops are also protected from malware. Updates, I would say always do it. Is there any excuse that you can think of to not run an update? Okay, um, okay let's ignore Windows updates. How about a good reason to not install regular Linux updates? I'll get back to you. Um, okay, subscribe to the Postgres announce, the SSH list. If you use Nginx, Nginx has their own list. Subscribe to those, because then you know when stuff comes out, when new versions come out. The distros have a lag of a few days sometimes. Some packages, they, the, the like, um, open SSH liaises with the package managers for the distros to make sure it gets out on the same day. Um, but subscribe to those lists so you know what's happening and you know when something come, when a CVE is issued against a package you're using. Run every single one of your Postgres minor updates. Keep up to date on it. Run all of your OS updates. 
What about your application libraries that you're using, your application that you're using? Make sure they are updated too, because you need to know, are there any vulnerabilities in any of those packages that you're using? And to come back to that thing about downtime, your database is never too important to update it. If you think it's too important and you can't afford the downtime, you should actually be having high availability. So you should never sit within the situation where you say, my database is too important, I can't go down. I'm still running on Postgres 9.5.3. Um, sorry, that was, that was a bad stab. It's, it's dot 13 now. <laughs> sorry. You should never be running on that old version of whatever you're running on because I can't shut the database down. If that is the case, you should have high availability in place so that you can shut the one down, update it, bring it back up, have your data replicate back up, and then update the other one. The risk is always just too high running on unprotected versions. It's not just that. Some, version, some minor versions uh, fix mi actually quite significant bugs in, your, in the thing or performance improvements. So always perform updates. On an application side, protect against things like SQL injection. Okay, it sounds obvious, but sanitize data coming in so that you can't, um, so that it can't be used against your database. But what happens if somebody types in some data and then you simply just display it straight back to them? So sanitize against the outputting of data. So just as much as SQL injection is a problem, where somebody types in a SQL command into the database or into, your, into a login form or any other form and it runs directly on database, somebody can type in HTML into a form and have it just displayed straight back at them. And that's where you get things like cross-site cross scripting attacks. So sanitize both in and out data all the time. Use roles to limit access to your data. That sounds obvious, but people don't always do it. PCR also says that you need to look at logging and auditing. So log as much as you can but be sensitive of information appearing in your logs. So you don't want sensitive information or with like PG Crypto, your key appearing in your logs. You can log your connections and disconnections. So if something, if you have a breach, you can go in and see, okay, I've got these connections from these unknown addresses. This is potentially a source of where it happened. Also look at centralizing your logs. So you can have Postgres uh, send its logs to syslog and have all the servers send their syslog logs to a central place. And the reason for that is somebody logs in on a server, they have the ability to stop syslog, to clear the logs, remove all traces that have existed, whereas if you're shipping it to a central server, if they try and do that, they would have to hack into the central, central logging server and, uh, and clear the logs there. So it just makes it more difficult. Auditing. There's a few options. There's audit trigger and PG audit. Um, I know Lloyd was talking about it. I don't know if he got to the audit stuff in his talk. But go have a look. Those are the two options that are available for auditing within Postgres. And that's basically what PCI sort of dictates. Are there any questions? Uh, if you do have a question, wait for a mark, please. A mark is coming. Is there a way to sanitize your Postgres logs if you know, for example, that there's one function you call, let's say, to log in application users, and that function takes sensitive details as arguments? And yeah. you, can you configure Postgres to strip that mm, one, no. or sanitize it somehow? That one no, that's, that's that. the one, one thing. I, I often get asked, how do, uh, can't we sanitize only PG crypto? And the answer is no, because from a Postgres side, it just logs everything according to minimum durations. So hopefully at some point they do have an ability, but right now there's no way to say, don't log this. What you can do is you can change your logging verbosity. You can go terse default and verbose. Verbose logs everything, and terse logs very little. So you can try turning the level down, so you know something went wrong here, but you don't necessarily have all the parameters that were sent. So that's one way to do it. The SSH, uh, you said no direct SSH. Is it specifically to the database server? Any server in your, in your network. Because if I log into your mail server and it's on the same network, I can then try and, as a local connection, make a connection to your other server. And if you use certificates? Well, SSH doesn't need certificates. 
So, but that's but, why I'm saying rather use a VPN. VPN into your network, and then from there you can SSH, because then you're in a, in a, in a known environment. Okay. And I think we've reached Thanks. time. Time's up. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much.